guest today. I have uh, Carlos in the house. He's actually a, uh, actually, tell, yeah. tell what you do. Absolutely. So I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. I work a lot <clears throat> with patients that come to see me struggling with depression, anxiety, PTSD, and sometimes relationship issues. And, and I had the pleasure of uh, speaking to him before the live today. And his background is actually very interesting how it relates to what he does. Uh, you were a firefighter, correct? Yeah, so I actually served as a firefighter for about seven years. And prior to that, I was <clears throat> in the military. So I'm very familiar um, with PTSD, the symptoms of PTSD, depression, how all of, the, all of these things come out as a result of high levels of, of stress and obviously traumatic incidents. And that's pretty much what got you into uh, to wanting to do what you're doing, correct? Absolutely. I saw that here. I, I noticed all of these experiences with other, you know, other heroes, other firemen, sure. firewomen, uh, and folks in the military who, you know, while very resilient in their mm -hmm. personality and who they were, uh, with enough exposure to trauma, sometimes even with just one exposure to trauma, wow. they were suffering. And sometimes that didn't always look like severe levels of depression. Sure. Sometimes it looked like increased alcohol or substance use. Sometimes it looked like marital problems, right? And so I think it's, it's always good to talk a little bit about what some of these things look like, right? So that we can see the signs either in ourselves or, or a loved one. So that brings me to the next thing, trauma. You mentioned trauma. And what I do, as everybody knows out there, is we do personal injury. And unfortunately, it's a lot of trauma. People are involved in car accidents. They're slip, they slipped and they fell. Um, they're losing work. They're having financial difficulties because they can't pay their bills because they're out of work, you know, they have the injuries. So tell me, doctor, uh, tell me more about how does what you do, particularly the post-traumatic stress sure. and depression, how does it relate to uh, auto accidents, for example? Absolutely. So we have to think of an auto accident <clears throat> um, in some ways as a grieving process and a loss. And I'm not just talking about maybe the loss of a loved one who was in the vehicle. Um, which does happen. Which happens, which right? Does and, happen, and that's yeah. traumatic in and of itself. It um, but what about an injury that you sustain and now you're not able to go back to work? So the loss of a job, the loss of, you know, finances. Of course. Um, and really, in some ways, we're, we're sort of taken out of our role. We're, we're sort of left, if, if there's a significant injury, we have to deal with that mental stress. Um, and so there's all of these different things that can start to come up for us when it disrupts our, our day to day. Right. Because we're, we're creatures of habit. Right? Yes. We, we like structure, we like certainty, and when, when something like this happens, it, it just throws our world in, into a loop. Um, and I think when we're dealing with that loss is when we start to see symptoms of depression, symptoms of we're feeling more isolated. Maybe we're feeling guilty. We yeah. feel at fault for what happened to of us. Of course, even when they're not at fault. Even when they're not at fault. Even when they're not at fault, right? exactly. And they should have left that day, or they should have left, they should have done whatever called so-and-so. I mean, it's, there's a lot of things. That's, that's absolutely what you hear. Yeah. I should have left five minutes earlier. I shouldn't have been late to work that exactly. day, you know, and, and all of these other things. So now add that guilt and that, that shame to what's already going on in terms of physical or mental injuries. Of course. Um, when it comes to PTSD, I think most people out there think PTSD and they think of two things, uh, military combat mm -hmm. or someone who's been sexually abused. Right? Yes. That's sort of the first thing that comes course, to mind. Of course. But PTSD can actually be anything that's either happened to you, life threatening, or, or, or you've had the fear of, of, of being, uh, of death. Which um, is auto accidents a lot auto of Auto accidents, right? Exactly. Yep. But we don't think about the bystander who saw a that's, traumatic accident. That's true. Exactly. Right? So even witnessing a traumatic event can trigger PTSD. Here's another one people don't know hearing about a traumatic event. So think about your 911 dispatchers. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. They don't see any of it, but they're on the phone with yeah. traumatic incidents and traumatic events, and they also can um, can deal with PTSD. Um, so well, even the cops that even the law enforcement comes out and the and the firefighters, they see the worst of the worst many times. The cleanup crew seen the worst of the worst many times. So absolutely. I see that. Absolutely. I, I mean, I won't even go into the number of calls. Uh, of trauma that we've seen because firefighters are also medically trained and so of course. They're, they're usually EMTs or paramedics and so when there's accidents when there's deaths they're the first ones on scene yeah um, and you know even some of the strongest men and women that I've known in the military and on the fire department and even uh, you know police officers um, 
no matter how mentally strong, it's only a matter of time. We, we can only take so much psychologically I can of, see of seeing these, these, these traumas. Um, some of the things to think about when we see PTSD, um, right? So part of the criteria of the diagnostic manual that we use in my field to ascertain whether <clears throat> someone has PTSD, mm -hmm. have they witnessed or been a part of that traumatic event? Are they having flashbacks? So actually, and you continue with that, but the flashbacks yeah. happens a lot of times on people when they crash at intersections or certain areas, they have a fear. Like yes. literally every time they walk, go through that uh, intersection on their car, mm -hmm. they, they, they freeze up, which causes other problems. Absolutely. So the, talking about the flashbacks, because that happens quite a Absolutely. bit. Absolutely. And Edward, that's even enough to get on the road again. That's right? Exactly. That's because how many times road. haven't you seen people that will just never drive again? After yes, or for like months. Right. You know, right. so... Yeah, and, and so now we're talking about anxiety. Anxiety every time they get on the road, uh, that deep, profound fear of, of will this happen again. That's sort of a symptom of, of PTSD. The, the flashbacks, there could be nightmares, recurring thoughts of the traumatic event. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Um, there's also a, a negative mood system uh, symptoms, and that can look like, again, depression. That can look like anxiety, irritability. Uh, a really difficult time dealing with stress. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's so many different symptoms that can be present for someone with PTSD. Now, what if somebody doesn't readily recognize it? What symptoms like lack of sleep, uh, you know, some people get, you know, physical issues, mm -hmm. things in their mouth. I mean, you know, like, like I know myself yeah. because when I go through stress, I have trouble sleeping mm -hmm. and I get uh, these sores in my mouth. Yes. And it just happens. And my dentist always says it's from, from stress. Yeah, from stress, increased cortisol, increased exactly. cortisol affecting our gastric system. <clears throat> more gas, you know, more gas is coming up, and that's where we, we find some of those. Um, but increased irritability. And so that's just, you know, you wake up in the morning and every little thing is just getting on your nerves. Yes. Right? Um, decreased sleep. Um Sometimes you feel like isolating. You don't want to be around friends and family when, when you typically would be. Sure. Um, you can start to experience physical symptoms. So maybe gastric problems. Okay. Maybe soreness in different parts of the body. Maybe different aches that you're not used to. Even back problems have been associated. With I can symptoms. see that. Yeah. With yeah. your tents and stuff like that. Yeah, with, I can definitely tense. see that. Right. So, and we can discuss depression and uh, post-traumatic stress a little bit differently, but on the uh, post-traumatic stress what are the some remedies or what mm -hmm. some things that people can do on themselves and if not what can they do with somebody like yourself yeah um so <clears throat> I, th I think when it comes to ptsd uh, you know if we were talking about something like anxiety or even depression and i don't want to say that one's milder than the other um but there are a lot of strategies that we can give to somebody with anxiety sure. for instance okay breathing techniques um, you know, going for a walk when you're starting to feel anxious, um, you know, different forms of exercise and yoga. With PTSD, it's a little bit different. Okay. With PTSD, my first inclination is to say, seek some health, mental health counseling. Okay. Um, because those symptoms can really turn on us quickly. And the depression can get very severe very quickly. And if that depression gets severe enough, now we're talking about thoughts of suicide, thoughts I of see. not wanting to, to be wow. alive anymore. Um, but I would say the first strategy, if, if you think you're experiencing PTSD, is to become aware of the symptoms. You can go online, Google PTSD symptoms, right, through the American Psychological Association, because there's a lot of garbage out there. Yes, fake news. Yeah, fake news. Of course. And just look through those symptoms. And I think you'll be able to sort of self-identify and say, hey, wait, maybe there's something here. Or maybe I don't fit each and every single one of these diagnoses. And this is something that happened with mm -hmm. a lot of vets okay. through the VA or through some other organization that they didn't get an official diagnosis because there's a lot of criteria you have to meet. I see. But just because they came up short... Doesn't mean they don't have it. Doesn't mean they don't have all the symptoms and are struggling. I can see that right? completely. Um, also, if you, if you see a family member, and, and we can sense when our family members or loved ones are, are sort of off. Of course. Right? Yes. Or, or they're not, you know, they're not engaging us like we used to, or they're spending more time by themselves. That's a good opportunity to sort of come and say, hey, what, what's going on? Let's, let's talk. Let's, you know, maybe let's go talk to a, a counselor and, okay. and just sort of see what, what's going on. Um, I know there's a lot of stigma around mental health, and a lot of people are, are so cautious 
about seeking out therapy or counseling. But what I always say is, let's just see if, if there's something going on. <clears throat> if there isn't, great. Yeah. Hey, now we know that you know that, that you're good. But if there is, then let's address it. Let's let's give you some of the coping skills so that day to day you're not feeling so overwhelmed. And you know, bringing up coping, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people bring up coping in a different way. Some people uh, have addictions. They go to, to drugs. They go to alcohol. They go to um, you know, one extreme to the next, uh, which also could be a problem. And, and I and I'm sure uh, you know, Dr. Garcia can can kind of ex- elaborate a little bit more on the on what he's seen, Mm -hmm. you know, as far as the coping, because those are temporary fixes. They're like band-aids, but they're not solutions. Um, Tell me some things that people can do or whenever people are going through these types of coping, Mm -hmm. negative coping, Mm -hmm. what what could you do to help them, I guess, get off those issues in in more positive? Absolutely. So I think anytime we're trying to replace a, a negative habit, we need to implement a positive habit. Okay. Right? Um, and I, I get for a lot of folks, this can be very difficult because my understanding of anyone that comes into my office and is using or abusing alcohol or drugs, um, who is maybe, um, you know, maybe they're, they're overeating, okay. right? Maybe they don't want to get out of bed or just sitting in front of the TV all day. These are all ways of numbing out the pain. Sure. Right. Numbing out the pain. And so when someone comes in and says, I'm drinking every day, um, my instinct is not to say, well, let's put you on a regimen to drink less. No, my instinct is to say, what are we numbing out? What are, what are the feelings yeah, what's that the are root? in there? Yeah, well, let's get that to makes, the root yeah, cause. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Right? Um, but for those that, that <clears throat> aren't having as serious as a problem, I say, start implementing some positive coping skills. Uh, there's so many things out there for self-care, okay. whether it's going to a gym, whether it's yoga. I really believe in the value of just talking. I think that makes sense. It's incredible. I had a a client just yesterday who, second session, and uh, I said, you know, how are you feeling this week? He goes, so much better. I said, what do you attribute that to? I came and talked to you, and I opened up about things that I've been holding in my whole life. Well, because a lot of times they don't want to talk to their friends because, one, they're biased, and another, they're judging. Right. So, I mean, that's true. It's hard for us to stay out of judgment. <laughs> it is. It is. Because we're still human beings at the end of the day. I mean, yeah. you know, even though we yeah. try not to be judgmental, and your job, you know, from what I understand, mm-hmm. is one, you don't know the person as your friend or family member. Right. You're looking at it from the outside perspective and giving them, you know, unbiased uh, opinions, which they don't, they may not get from their friends or family. Correct. It's a very objective uh, stance. I can, you know, from a distance sort of see... You know, what's going on with this individual? What is the deeper thing? They're telling me one thing, but I'm noticing another thing. Of course. You know? So one of the things that we deal with quite a bit, too, is uh, wrongful death cases. Uh, wrongful death is somebody that was involved in a car accident or an accident or whatever the case may be, and they passed away. And, of course, the person that passed away, as bad as it sounds, they don't feel anything after that. But mm-hmm. the the ripple effect is the family, the friends, and everything else. Um Tell me more about that because, I mean, that leads to deep depression. Yes. And I've noticed from even from my clients that the survivors, mm-hmm. it leads them to act out in certain ways. Yes. Um, it. How can those people get help? Yeah. So I, I think <clears throat> the grieving process is something we have to talk about because most people, and whether this is a, a cultural bias or something we learned in our own culture, um, is that there's a time frame around grieving. Or that we must grieve in a certain way. Sure. If I'm not crying, then that means I'm not hurting. Of course. Um, you know, if I'm still, uh, you know, if I still miss that person two years from now, then there must be something wrong with me. Everybody's process is different. Yes. Everyone grieves differently. <clears throat> However, when you notice that maybe you're spiraling because now you're drinking, you know, out of control every day a lot. Of course. Um, you know, maybe you are distancing yourself from, from everybody you know. Those are clear signs that something may be going on. Um, while at the same time saying, give yourself that time to grieve in whatever way it feels okay for you. Sure. Right? Um, and then the truth is, you know, think about it. Uh, put yourself in a position to empathize when you've lost someone like that. Right. Course, We're so hard. ready to jump into let's give this person, uh, you know, some positive statements. Or, of course, but that, you know, they may not be ready for that yet. Right. 
they may not be ready for yeah. it. And so it's about giving people the space mm -hmm. to grieve in the way that feels okay for them. And keeping an eye on them to make sure that they're not getting into very self-destructive behaviors and habits. And we've seen that on our side. Yeah. You know, like grieving mothers, uh, you know, whatever, they, you know, they tend to do certain things and, and or, you know, fathers or whatever. I mean, you know, they, they turn to going out. They turn to, you know, very unproductive yes. activities. Yes. And, and you have to just kind of remind them, say, listen, I, I understand this is happening, but you can't do this because yeah. it's going to affect you and your other kids or whatever the case is. Absolutely. I think the most powerful thing we can ever do for someone who's struggling, PTSD, depression, grieving, is just to be there. Believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Not to jump into advice giving, to stay away from judgment. And, and that's hard. It is. Because as, as a friend or as, as anybody, you immediately want to help that person. Right. Like right away, like let me give you advice. Exactly. You know, you don't want to listen. You want to yeah help. But yeah, that that's always a solution. I think that comes from like we we are sort of hurting for them. Of we, course, and, and so we want to like, oh my God, what can I do for this person? Mm -hmm. But sometimes if we find ourselves in a place where, you know, we say something like, well, it will get better, sure. or we say something like, you know, at least you didn't lose both of your kids, for example. In essence, what we're saying to that person is minimizing their experience. Yeah, which it's is sort of saying you shouldn't feel that way. Exactly. When that's exactly what they feel. Um, so it brings me back to the point. Sometimes just just being there and listening and giving somebody empathy and saying, "Gosh, you know, I can't imagine what you're going through." Of course. But that must be really tough. And leaving it at that, and well, letting yeah. that person sort of express those emotions as they need. Or the alternative, talk to somebody that actually, you know, can give, give them that 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 support without going through all these mistakes. I guess you can say, because right. I mean, because one thing can set them off for something else. Yeah, and you know, I, I'll tell you this, Edward. I think, unfortunately, there's still such a stigma around mental health mm -hmm. that people are fearful. They are right. They they think they're going to come to a psychologist, and and sometimes they think, well, they're just going to give me medication, even though that's not what we do. Of or, course. Or, you know, they're, they're that numbs the pain. Doesn't it numbs the pain. Of course. Right. It's just another poor coping mechanism. Exactly. Um, when the reality is you're coming in to have someone hear your story and someone get to get things from your point of view. Sure. Because oftentimes we feel like, yeah, my family doesn't get it and my friends don't really get it. Um, but here's a person that's going to get it. Here's a person that's on your side. Here's a person that's going to help you navigate those really difficult emotions. Okay. So for everybody, I know we've been going now for a while, um, for everybody out there, if you can just, if somebody wanted to talk to you about any of these issues or anything related to mental health, how can they get a hold of you? Absolutely. Um, so my uh, practice is Tampa Counseling and Wellness. They can email me at livewell at Tampa CW, the CW is for Counseling and Wellness, uh, Tampa, uh, livewell at TampaCW.com, or they can reach out to me. Sometimes just a simple text. They okay. have a simple question. 813-644-1791. It doesn't have to be a therapy session. Maybe you just have a few questions, want to okay. know a little bit more about the process. Feel free to reach out. Okay. And as everybody out there knows, uh, you know, Attorney of the Reyes with the Reyes firm. And, you know, what we do is we team up with other professionals. We don't pretend that we know all the answers. You know, we are quarterbacks to try to make sure that they're getting the proper recommendations whatever the case is but we want to make sure that your health is paramount and your recovery is is uh paramount as well um it to look at this as as a whole not just uh for a financial standpoint i know all the commercials and everything's always want to push the the settlement stuff and yes that does happen but you are still a person and your health is so important to us and that's why we want to bring professionals uh to talk yeah. and to, to try to elaborate and try to educate everybody out there um, to make to that way you know that we're always there for you. It's not just about the financial side. It's about you and your health and your family, and your mental health as well. So uh, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. And uh, if you guys have any questions, I'll tag him in the in the um, I'll edit the post now and I'll tag him on it as well. Um, feel free to ask any questions, and and I'm sure we'll be sharing it. And if you have any questions in the comments, we'll answer them throughout the day. Um, and we're gonna re-edit this video again. That way we can play it uh, going forward. So if you missed it now, we'll have the full video um, in a couple of weeks as well.